。接下来，让我们欢迎，呃，我们知道游戏里面非常音乐非常重要，那也知道它的意义的存在。那存在音乐过程当中，我们需要了解音乐家想表达自己跟他的生活经验，那而不是知识化的一个形式创作在音乐上面。那我们该如何平和自己的一些想法，跟符合游戏的需求呢？也并跟游戏有一些连接。那让我们来欢迎 Terence 跟 Janice 带来的精彩演讲。Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Terence, and this is Janice. And for about seven years, Janice and I we co-composed the music for an indie game called Tunic, which was released last year. And that's Tunic. And for us, it was a really big undertaking、um, because in the end, we made about three and a half hours of music and released a 61-track album. And so, throughout this process, we learned a lot about what was important to us about the process of making music for games. And so, today, we wanted to share some of those learnings.、Uh, some of the things we'll talk about.、Um, the first one is why do we think personal expression is important in game music?、Um, basically, what it means to us and how we think it strengthens the game. And then the second thing is. How can the game's design guide the musical direction in a way that deepens the player's experience? And lastly, we'll talk about how、um, what developing personal expression looks like for us. How we filled up our creative well so we could trust in our intuition and、um, when it was time to compose. And we'll share some examples from Tunic. We'll listen to them, and、um, there'll be time at the end for some questions as well. Okay, so first one: Why do we think personal expression is important in game music? When you make music for a game,、um, there's going to be a lot of strong external pressures、um, that will influence your music.、Um, for example, the need to、um, appeal to a wider audience. You might feel like you need to、uh, make your music more accessible, so then you could make more sales. And there's also the pressure of people's expectations.、Um, what do people expect this genre of game to sound like?、Um, you might feel like your pressure to make your music fit into a certain mold, which is the mold of what、um, people expect to hear when they hear the term game music. And so labels like shop music or battle music, world music, everyone has expectations of what those should sound like, and people feel really strongly about the games they play and. Also about what they sound like, but one thing we learned that reassured us a lot and helped alleviate those pressures is that the game is going to do a lot of the heavy lifting for you. I mean, if, if players like the game, then it's pretty likely that they'll also form a deep connection with the music simply by associating it with the game. For example, if the game is emotional or awe-inspiring or intense or just fun, then the players.、Um, Pretty likely to attribute those qualities to、um, the music as well. Like if you look at YouTube videos of game soundtracks, even ones that you don't really connect with,、um, you'll still see that the comment sections are filled with people who just filled with nostalgia for the music, just because the game was memorable to them. And also from a business perspective, a good game with a sizable audience is probably the best. Marketing that any independent musician can ask for, because we all know that it's like it's basically impossible for an independent musician to reach a large audience just by themselves.、Um, but to make music for a game, you get the whole audience of the game, and of all the people watching them play the game,、um, people watching the trailers and anything else, they're all going to be hearing your music, and they're going to be associating it with something that they are enjoying, hopefully.、Um, So many of these pressures, they're they're borne by the game, not by the music. And so, with the game giving you such a strong starting point, it would be a shame to really worry about those pressures. Instead, the game the game is calling for your personal expression. It needs your unburdened creativity. 
And personal expression is guided by your intuition and your feeling. It's the basis for emotional connection, which uh, we think that helps games or any creative work land a lot strong, more strongly with players. So instead, if, you, if you're just focusing on what the audience is expecting, then you risk creating something sterile, something that feels like it was built to specifications. Um, something that, I mean, maybe might even be replaced by machine learning in a few years. But instead, if you focus on your personal expression, then that will result in music that feels like it was made by a real person um, with all the depth and character and imperfections that make it feel alive. And living music has the power to keep a game fresh in our minds for a long time. Every time we revisit those feelings, when it's time to, when we listen to its music. Uh, we've seen that ourselves uh, as people who play games. Um, we still listen to music from games that we fell in love with as children. And every time those games get re-released or the studios kind of come out with new games, we are... The, the experience is still fresh in our minds, so we want to play them. Um, and we've also seen it with indie games, like Terrence's work on Dust Force. People are still listening to the music now, and it's been more than 10 years since it came out, and there's still new people finding out about the game through the music. Um, the second point we wanted to cover was how can the game's uh, design guide the musical direction in a way that deepens the player's experience of the game. And it feels a little weird to say, this is how we did it and this is what works because a lot of the time we actually don't know what we're doing and we don't know exactly how things work and what works for people until it, it happens. And we know that every project is a little bit different and everybody works differently. So these are just really specific to our experience and we wanted to share some of those moments in retrospect when we felt that the game's design and the direction was conducive to having personal expression in the music. And then also how the game felt more cohesive as a whole. And if we had to boil it down, we'd say that trust and communication between the developers and composers is pretty important for these mo moments. And one of when designers trust composers, and this is shown through the space that they give them to experiment and do what they do best, then composers then also have this full freedom to reciprocate that trust in the designer's vision. Of course, when you join a project, you kind of go in with a baseline of trust in each other, but it's important to understand also that that's something built over time through good communication and receptivity to each other. Um, when the direction and feedback prioritizes guidance over control using descriptions of feelings, vibes, lore, whatever is happening in the scene rather than exact details on this is how it should be made, um, this is what I want it to sound like exactly, then if you just kind of use more general feeling, then composers have the freedom to follow their own intuition. If you find yourself needing to control every aspect, then maybe there isn't much trust or maybe the vision itself isn't being communicated in a way that everyone feels free to bring to life together. Um, this, isn't, this isn't to say that you can't really say to composers, oh, um, I want you to use drums or I want there to be a beat. Like that's all okay, but more that the purpose of your direction and the feedback is more to provide an image for composers to sense into rather than to, to, rather than to lay out a play-by-play -play of how it's going to happen. Yeah, and one thing I noticed that about feedback is I think tact is really important during feedback. Um, I think strongly critical feedback, it can really kill the mood because creativity requires a lot of vulnerability. And you might think like maybe composers or artists should, they should just have a thicker skin and be less sensitive about it. But I think in this context, their sensitivity is a strength, not a weakness. Because they've, they've opened up their sensitivity and vulnerability in order to be best attuned um, to their own intuition and their expressiveness. 
So if you forget to respect that in your feedback, then you risk dampening that trust and having them shut off that sensitivity. And it also goes the other way. It's important there for there to be space for composers to voice their opinion on musical choices because as composers, it's our job to understand the subtle impacts that changes in the music will have on the overall vision of the game. And we wanted to go over some examples that um, we found to be helpful in our work at Tunic. Um, we were really, really lucky to work with the team um, on Tunic because from the very start, the team, Andrew, Kevin, and Eric, they didn't want music to be an afterthought. Like, it's not unusual for music to come in at the end to fill in the gaps, but Andrew, the lead designer, he reached out to Terrence really early on in development, and his vision for the game called for music to play a really big role in making the world feel alive and add a whole layer of cohesion to the game overall. And in the design docs, Andrew wrote out whatever was going on in his head about a space or a part in the game, and he used things like keywords um, that popped up in his head, um, moods, intensity levels, ideas he had about the music, if he was listening to any specific music when building the spaces. Um, he would send reference photos and even instruments he had in mind, but then he just left that to us to explore what that meant. Um, yeah, his, um, his overall vision of the game, it was really evocative to us because I mean, he basically described the game like you're, you're this little fox and you're dropping into this mysterious world and you're trying to figure out why you're there. And also the world doesn't really care about you. It's there existing whether you are or not. And so that was kind of exciting and empowering to us because it was sort of asking for us to bring those areas to life through the music specifically. Sometimes it's really tempting to see, oh, this is, this is an adventure game, so I'm going to go in and I'm going to make some adventure music. And that could work, but that's kind of just on the surface, and it doesn't really get to the heart of what makes a game like Tunic, Tunic. So if we had made adventure music, then the feeling of being dropped into a foreign land, it would be lost in what might instead evoke feelings of, I am the hero, I am the protagonist, and this world is here for me. That wasn't in line with what Andrew's vision was. Yeah, in his vision, a lot of the music um, is supposed to be about evoking life in the world happening without you, not you being the front and center. Um, and so we thought maybe having a specific example of a description he gave to us and what it sounded like in end might help convey what we mean. So he, um, he sent us a description of an area of the game called the temple, and this was the description. I'll just read it out loud. Um, at the top of the stairs, beyond the golden door, lies the temple interior. Once a place of worship, it has been sealed tight in the hopes that no one will inadvertently release its prisoner. An enormous hexagonal gyroscope spins, powered by the engines deep below. Its rotation and geometry are tuned ever so carefully so that it can project beyond the veil and cast its imprisoning shadow into the shore between dimensions. The sound here is reverent, broad, spacious, slow. This is a place of extreme patience. Um, it also helps that he's a good writer. And so here's a snippet of what it sounded like in the end. Um, that's the area. Let's see. We'll just play a snippet.
So our job is to take the designer's descriptions and interpret them in a musical way. Then this doesn't always look like a literal translation, and um, it's really great for leaving space for. If you go in with that mindset, it's really great for leaving space for just any, just a varied experience of interpretations. Um, another example we wanted to show was this area in the game called the Ziggurat. And this is the description that Andrew gave us. So the ziggurat is what we call the vast, empty space deep beneath the earth, a metal substructure to the world full of towering columns and weird machinery. Its features are cold, metal structures in the distance, horrifying beings distended and corrupted by unknowable energies harnessed from the space between dimensions. It's creepy and metallic and spookscape. Tense strings and otherworldly echoes, these were things that he was envisioning, churchy doom, tolling bell, distant organ, unintelligible whispers. There's an unsettling feeling of dread. And it sounds of eldritch machinery, prisms of alien metals groaning with secret purpose. And this is a little bit about of what it sounded like in the end. So the original image that Andrew's description gave us, I think there's a lot of ways to interpret it. And it, at first glance, it's pretty dark and it's pretty ominous. And it would make sense to make something that sounds horrifying and wretched and, and really dark. Um, but his words, they actually made us more curious about how a place like this comes to be over the years because in his description, it sounded like there was a lot of pain. And when we see that, we ask, what happened? If we shine a light on what was in that darkness before it became dark, then that contrast can be very powerful. And what, what can drive someone to do such unspeakable things and fall into this sense of madness? And if his original vision is asking music to help bring a place to life, then what that means for us is that it has to become a part of the place. It has to become a part of its history, its dreams and desires, just as much as its fall and corruption. Um, okay. Um, another point with collaborating between game design and music is that when there's openness to venture together, Oh, when there's openness to venture into the unknown together in collaboration, then the shared vision becomes more than the sum of its parts. 
right? Because the, the vision might not be super defined at the start. In our experience, when the designers, um, they, they might have really strong high level ideas, but a lot of the specifics, they're uncovered together over the course of development. Um, and a lot of the development comes from the bottom up, and you only see that once you're making it. And this vision of the game, it's not unidirectional from the game design to the music. The music's influencing the game design too, or it can. And this feedback loop, I think that can add a lot of cohesion to the design. For example, in Tunic, we would, sometimes we'd send out a concept track for an area that hadn't really been made yet in the game. The art wasn't there yet. And then the, the rest of the team, they would listen to the music and then they would get really inspired while they were making the space and it would kind of change how they were approaching the art and the design of it. And I saw that too in Dust Force a long time ago when I was making music for that. Every time I made a new track, it would give a lot of inspiration to the rest of the team and give them a big boost of motivation, um, get them motivated to make new areas. And that's really important on a small team. And there's another example in Tunic which uh, was a lot more complicated. The, the team had this idea to add a secret musical language into the game. And that was really exciting but also challenging for us because, because before we talked about the way that they wanted to integrate music into the design, but now what if the design was integrated into the music? And that was really new territory for us because it meant that there would be very specific musical aspects that we had to consider when writing it. And we weren't sure how to reconcile this with the need to um, have the space to express freely. I think in the end we approached it as having it as a musical tool in the toolbox rather than keeping it as like this theme that had to be up front and center. And also this approach added a lot of secretness to it which was good. And there were a few times when we had to push back a little bit on how upfront the language and the music would be in a couple of the tracks. Just because to us the language has a very specific melodic quality to it that would stick out a lot and affect the cohesiveness on the tracks. Yeah, and that was kind of an example of where the team um, had enough, they gave us enough space and trust to when we voiced our opinion about something musically, there was space for you know, a lot of things to adapt. And it kind of leads us to our, our next point, which is even in a collaboration, it's really, really important to trust your work um, as a composer and to know that your sensitivity and your intuition is exactly what is needed to make the project the best it can be. Um, we want to talk about this because um, I came onto this project a lot later than Terence. Um, and it happened in a very gradual way. I was just kind of helping out here or there. And, and it was mostly in very little parts early on. And in those parts, Terrence always wanted me to write whatever came. And, and I really felt free to because it, it was just like a little flavor over the whole thing. Um, there was no pressure. But then as the project got bigger and bigger and there needed to be more help, um, suddenly the expectations kind of changed in my mind. I noticed that when I sat down to work on bigger portions, I started to make myself more invisible. And I thought that my job is actually not to make my music, but to make Terrence's music, to emulate Terrence's style. And in the end, Terrence had to convince me that this wasn't just him anymore and that the project needed both of us and it needed the, the raw collision of the two of us coming together, it, both of our expressions. A specific example was I, I kept putting off the boss tracks um, for a long time. I was just chipping away at all, every, every other track, just, just don't touch the boss tracks. And I was hoping that eventually Terrence would do it. It's kind of like working on a group project. I just did all the parts I wanted to and I hoped he would do the parts I didn't want to do it. And, but eventually, if he's too slow, then you eventually get there and you have to do it. And you don't have a choice. So 
I didn't think I could do it. And I didn't think that because I didn't feel like I had that energy in me. And I was really intimidated by the whole idea of boss music that I would listened to growing up. And also, Terrence had already written a few, and I felt well, there's no way I'm going to be able to match something that makes sense in, in line with that. So, in the end, I tried to do something a little bit different and approached it from my own point of view, which was a little bit more emotional, where I tried to explore what it would be like to be the fox in that moment. Up until now, all the area music, we, it was about being the world. But in the boss tracks, it was about what does it mean to fight right now? What am I fighting for? And then also, each of the bosses, what are they fighting for? Why, why are they fighting so hard? So I think going through that process, it taught me that I could trust my own ability to empathize rather than my technical ability, and that that would um, guide the composition. And it felt really good to be able to write more honestly, and that actually ended up giving Terrence a boost when he would jump in on the track and add his own voice. So we're going to play a little bit of one of the boss tracks. This is the librarian. When I was working on that track, um, I remember that I was kind of uh, sensing into a lot of storminess inside uh, that normally I hadn't really allowed myself to express through music before. And although it was in the original notes, I completely forgot about that, that there would be a thunderstorm during the fight. So it felt really serendipitous to see it put together. And it was very new, although uncomfortable at first to be able to trust that those feelings had a place in a game. Yeah, I, I like the direction of that so much that we went back and we added some of that empathetic perspective and energy to the other boss tracks. And I think that made them, it gave them the final piece that they really needed. Um, another thing is one thing I learned about myself while working on this project was that I found that discomfort is actually a sign of growth. Um, sometimes, there it is. Um, sometimes while working, I, I get this feeling where I really don't want to work on a specific thing, um, or it becomes like really difficult to focus on it. I get this like urge to just switch, just distract myself. And I noticed that when I feel that, that's usually a signal that I'm about to um, push myself to do something that will teach me something new. And I found that if I just stick with it and just exert just a little bit extra during those moments, then I can make a small breakthrough and then the discomfort dissolves and I end up finding myself in exciting new territory where I feel uh, really motivated and I have all these new ideas. Um, one example of that was um, an area in the game called the quarry, and 
looks like that. And I made this track over a long period of time. I think maybe over a few years, like in different bits and pieces. And because I had different ideas of the idea of the quarry changed throughout development. And so, but I kind of liked each piece that I was making. Um, but in the end, I didn't know which one to use. And I had a lot of difficulty trying to put them together or to um, make something new. They had like different tempos and different tones. But I was, in the end, I was able to push through it and like find a way to connect them together using techniques that I don't normally do. So that felt really uncomfortable to have to learn how to do things like that. Um, and I was proud of how it turned out because it kind of ended up suiting the kind of the deconstructed feeling of the area of the quarry. Um, and here's that truck. Uh, one second. Sometimes, if we're talking about discomfort and trusting yourself, sometimes that trust is pure pain. And when you're working on a big project with a lot of stuff happening, but the vision is worth it. There was this one track we wrote at the last possible moment that we could. It wasn't a part of the original track list. It was only when the game was ready for launch. And we were doing our own very first playthrough of the whole game just to see how everything fit together. And we got to this part in the game that's a pretty emotional, uh, important, significant emotional part. And we noticed that a track that wasn't supposed to be there, like we wrote it for a lot later on in the game, it was being played there. And we learned that the team thought because the setting was the same and they didn't think that they'd need two different tracks. But for us, we... Now as players, we were like, we felt like we weren't quite there yet. It needed something different. Otherwise, sort of the connection and the impact of both scenes could be lessened. And that possibility, even if it was 1%, if it could be lessened, to us that was worth um, making a track at the very, very last minute. And so this was one of those times where we voiced our opinion pretty strongly and said that, um, we wanted to write a new track for this part. And just, just to give you some context, at that point, we'd been working every single day for months. 
um, literally from the moment we wake up until the moment we dropped dead <laughs> into bed. And right before launch, which is pretty common, I think, um, so right before launch, it was probably about midnight when we got to that part and we said, it needs a new track. So we, we spent, we didn't sleep that night and we wrote a new track for it. And, and another thing is, if you, like, you can't really hide your emotional state from your music. So that track, it ended up sounding exactly um, how it felt while we made it. And that, it sounded really stressful. But it happened to be that that is exactly what the, 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 the game needed at that point. It needed something that sounded stressful, and it was. <laughs> um, we don't have to play if you don't want to. Uh, okay, um, I won't play that one, it's too stressful. Yes, um, yes, too stressful. Okay, and so our last topic was uh, how do we develop our personal expression? At least for us, what, what is that like? Um, so I like to think of um, doing creative work as two different halves. There's the input and the output. Just breathing in and breathing out. And I think sometimes we put too much emphasis on the output because that's all you really see from other people and that's what other people see from you. And sometimes we get in the mindset that if we're not creating, then we're wasting time or being lazy. But when you create, you're using up energy, you're exerting yourself, and sometimes you can give up every last drop of yourself. You end up draining your well of creativity. And this can lead to uh, burnout, into self-doubt and even depression. So you need to fill yourself back up. I mean, if you drive a car, eventually you'll have to fill up on gas. But when we create art, we often forget to fill up the tank and then we chastise ourselves for not getting further. Uh, so what does it mean to fill up your tank of gas, to fill your creative well back up? For me, I think it means to live life and to get inspiration from the world. But the more important part about that is allowing yourself to do it. Because just the sound of that, it can sound like you're taking time off work, going on vacation or something, but really it's part of the job. Like a, an athlete, they're still on the job when they're training in the gym. And likewise, an artist is still on the job when they're um, researching and trying new things, getting new inspiration. So if we value artists for their expression, then we should expect their work to not just include breathing their life into their work, but also breathing in the world. You might feel guilty for taking the time to refill your well, but you really shouldn't because it's very important. It's also very important to just to learn to recognize when your well is empty um, so you know when to take your foot off the pedal. For example, for me, when I try to fill back up, I like to... Um, cook or play games or, or even do more work but on a different type of thing that works different creative muscles like programming. And also things like being in nature, they help me recharge or just simply taking a walk. I find sometimes I run out of this creative energy in the middle of working on something. I think that's really common. And I used to feel really bad about it. Um, but now I've kind of learned to recognize when it's happening and take a break because it can be counterproductive to force yourself and push through. Um, you, can, you can oversaturate your senses and de deaden your intuition that way. Like for music specifically, if you work on a music track too long and you just keep hearing the same thing over and over, eventually your ears grow accustomed to hearing it in a very certain way and you, you temporarily lose the ability to tell if what you're changing on it sounds good or, or bad. And I was really bad about this before. I would, I would work really hard on one track and burn out for at least the whole month between every single track. And that was really unsustainable for a game where we needed like 80 tracks. Um, okay, so if your output process doing the work, if that's time for intuition, then your input process, that's the time for analysis and reflection, more conscious um, things. 
It's a time to explore and understand. I find it's important to um, find inspiration outside of the medium that you work in. I think composers shouldn't just be drawing inspiration from other music or even other sounds, but also from, from anything really that you are interested in, from nature or books or friends, or even colors or smells or cats or textures, food, math, history, culture. You should explore and dig deeper towards the things that make you feel strong feelings, even if they're bad feelings. Um, and once in a while, step back and try to draw connections between the things that you connect with. Just be sensitive and discerning and be critical and honest with yourself. I think what you've explored, it reveals a lot about you, but expression is more than just what you've explored. It's about how it shapes you. Um, for example, developing your musical taste isn't simply about listening to new music. I don't think it's even really about sound. It's something more holistic about who you are. It's about the thing between you and the world, which is your feelings. And for me, it's just like a very specific feeling that I think, I think everyone feels. It's the feeling you get when you explore life and feeling that there's something beautiful and mysterious out there. And it's that yearning you get when you catch a glimpse of it. And it's hard to describe, but I think everyone's kind of searching for that in some way, consciously or not. So as artists, our job is to look for that as best as we can and then try to evoke the spectrum of feelings that surround it. Sometimes those feelings can feel like awe or beauty or sadness or nostalgia or some strange combination of them all. I think our expression and our values, they stem from this search. And I know all that sounds kind of touchy-feely, but my point is that you're exploration of what's important to you in your life. It allows you to deepen your expressiveness. And that gives you confidence in your intuition, which ultimately will strengthen your work. It'll make your work alive. And when your work is alive, then your process is, your work is alive when your process is guided intuitively by your values. Um, okay, so, I think I can wrap up some of the things we talked about. Um, those are just some of the things we learned. It's just our experience of, of working so far. Um, and I know a lot of it can feel very abstract, and that's because it is. I mean, most of the work that you do doesn't involve actually thinking about all this stuff. We weren't, for sure. But we just found that it helped to reflect on these things after, afterwards, to process it and to better prepare next time. So. The first thing we talked about was that expression is important because it makes your work human and alive. And I think every, every person experiencing it, every human is acutely attuned to detecting and connecting with those attributes. It, that makes for a stronger music and therefore a stronger game. Also, you should find a balance with the game through trust and communication with the developers and yourself. Um, you need to be receptive to your intuition and be open to where it's guiding you. And lastly, you need to take the time to fill your well of creativity, to learn and to recognize when it's been drained and not to beat yourself up over it. Um, to live your life knowing that developing your sense for what is meaningful, that that's contributing directly to your ability to express your creativity. I think at the end of the day, the, the most important thing is just to live in the process of doing the work. You'll see that the process of creating art is, it's kind of like a microcosm for the process of living life, where you explore, be sensitive to your surroundings, and trust your intuition, adapt, and share your feelings. If you do those things in your life, then, um, then you can do that in your work to create living art. Um, okay, so that was most of what we talked about, but we wanted to leave some time for questions and about anything really. Um, and that's our contact information if you want to know more. So, does anybody have questions? Sorry. <laughs> Thank you.
那如果有啊，这边有问题想要问。Yes, I would like to ask about the suggestion of uh the hardware between uh the difference. Maybe for now we have many consoles, and then maybe from the mobile speaker to the earphone or even the home theater. Is there any standard lines for us to follow to uh, find out the uh, key point? If we're making the songs, maybe we have to follow like the melody or the bass line, which is the most important. Um, yes, I. Usually, when we work, we we have. We kind of pick a reference set of speakers or headphones that sound really neutral and really doesn't really like color. The music too much, and we just try to do something that's like kind of good for everything. But then at the end,、um, sometimes we go through a mastering process, which helps kind of even all, all out. And like you kind of you just hand your music off to someone whose specialty is to make sure it sounds good on everything. But that's yeah, that <laughs> that's a difficult process because like you have to have it all done, and then. Um, it's kind of a long back and forth,、um, but we've we've released a lot of music in the past where we didn't really worry about that too much. I think if you just have like some hardware that sounds good to you and that、um, isn't too like bass heavy or something, if you make it for that, it should sound good on everything. I'm not sure if I heard correctly, but were you asking more about like the equipment or、um, the writing process? Oh, oh, actually, we just、uh, developing a mobile game, and、uh, I thought that the environment、uh, is very noisy. But I,、uh, I really impressive about your game.、Uh, you made a really immersive songs uh, by, uh, with the environment together. And then I just want to ask about if they use my, like mobile phone and、uh, in a noisy environment,、mm -hmm. and then experience the game. What's the most important thing you will keep in the song? Maybe let them to、uh, get into the environment. Right. Okay. Yeah. I guess that that would require conversation with the、um, sort of the audio direction,、um, finding out sort of what frequencies that they are going to be focusing on. Like if it's going to be more of a high frequency, like if, if it is a mobile game, my sense is that. People will have earbuds, and also people will be just playing on their phone. And generally, both earbuds and on their phone, maybe the baseline、um, won't be as deep as if people are playing cons console or、um, PC games where they're wearing like they just have bigger systems. That's just a pure physical limitation. So, I think just as a starting point, maybe it would be. Like just something to explore, explore. How could we work with the higher frequencies? Yeah. But I wouldn't limit it necessarily. But just to start from there, maybe. It is. We've never had to deal with that before. That is kind of a tricky problem because、yeah. the sound design of the game itself probably wants to reserve a lot of the higher frequencies for like the game sound effects. Yeah. So it really would have to be this detailed conversation with the sound designers. My intuition is, you can find nice melodic things in kind of a mid-range thing, and、yeah. I think I think the key would be to not try to overload everything with too thick of sounding of things. Like in our music, to the tunic soundtrack, it's very thick. There's like lots of pads and things going on, many many layers.、Um, but I imagine you would probably want to loosen. That up a bit and just have like a few elements. I think.、Mm. I don't know. That's actually pretty hard. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank、yeah. you for sharing. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Hello. Look, very great talk. Thank you. Thank you. I want to share a quote with you. Oh. I really like it's. Curiosity is not trivial. It is the respect one life pays to another. I think the cold story of Tunic is actually a horror horror story. It's a horror game, actually, right? <laughs> And I find that 
you, kept, you managed to capture the spirit of the game is actually the sympathy. Because there are a lot of things we don't understand. And it's evil and it's, it's horrible. It's like a disease. It's something that we cannot control. And around all your talk, you are finding this spirit. And you did it. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I, w did you say the technique was like the horror story? Uh, the that... tunic? Or oh, like oh, tunic. The, the... Oh, OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can it. definitely see that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we, it was, yeah, it was fun because we, we knew Tunic had this narrative arc that was really not kind of what you would expect. Like, it's very dramatic in unexpected ways. And so it gave us a lot of room to tap into everything that we wanted to get out there. And I think it was, it was a moment where what the game was going for and what we kind of wanted to do was really aligned. Mm -hmm. and that, that was, that gave me a lot of confidence that we could just yeah. be ourselves and have it work. Yeah. I feel like Tunic is a bit of, uh, it's really unique in the sense that it's, it's so cute and innocent from afar. You look at it and you're like, oh, this is going to be really lighthearted, but it's actually quite dark. And I think it would have been a missed opportunity if we had just focused on purely creating the, this dark ambience. Um, I think that true darkness is more all-encompassing than that when we can understand the full picture. Which I really liked the quote that you shared, by the way. Yeah. Thank you. Another Thank you. question. Is, oh, yeah. Can you also share about your experience in Hyperdemon? Since, oh. <laughs> oh, since you are yeah. working in a very different role in the team, right? Yes. Yeah. On Hyper, we, we just, for, okay, so my friends made a game called Hyper Demon, and it's a very different game from Tunic. It's a first person shooter. And we wanted to, we wanted to help out in some way. And we wanted to. We were just to, like fangirling from the side, being like, oh, it's so beautiful. Yeah. But we didn't like, we just, yeah. Yeah, and they already had like music. Uh, Eugene did the music for the game, mm -hmm. but we wanted, like, they wanted to collaborate with us as well, and we wanted to collaborate with them. The, one of the designers, he did the album cover for Tunic for us. And, oh, yeah. and he said, instead of paying me, can you please do some music for my game, Hyperdemon? Yeah, he made this, he made this. Uh, album cover image. And yeah. um, so when we, he asked us, we were like, of course. <laughs> and then um, uh, we knew Eugene was already doing it, and Eugene's so talented, and we didn't want to step on his toes. So we thought maybe what if we just record some sounds? Because it sounds like they really like working with samples um, of just things recorded and then ma mashing it together. And um, we did work, we did make one track for them. Yeah. But that, that went on the non-official yeah, album. Yeah, just as a concept. Yeah. So um, at the time, um, we had, I just learned, uh, you know, Erhu. I learned the Zhonghu for about a year. I was really bad at it. And um, I, we were like, okay, well, let's just embrace how bad I sound and play it wrong. And... So the doorman outside our apartment, he would tell me that you, you sound really bad. But I'm like, that's perfect because, you know, it would be, it's not meant to sound good. And um, so Eugene was able to take, well, Terrence processed the sound to make it sound a little bit less bad. Yeah, we used the textures. Of, yeah, we took the when textures. You, when you play a, our who run, it has... It's like cry all this like, like, texture to it, yeah. and so we were able to take advantage of that, and so that ended up being a main part of one of the like main mm. theme in the game. Um, yeah. And so it ended up being a small part of the game, but it was very, it was very, very, very small. The smallest thing. Yeah, it was yeah. fun collaboration. Yeah. Yeah, it was fun to have a glimpse into the way they work, though. Yeah. Which is very yeah. different. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
uh, very thanks for your sharing, and uh, sorry for my poor English. Oh, that's good. Okay. <laughs> uh, Oh, sorry. I wrote my question. Okay. Uh, I have a, some question for more, is more practical uh, reality uh, for money. In my, uh, at first, uh, do you think, uh, I, uh, do you, you, are you, uh, are you a, uh, uh, Game design team. One of, do you think you are one of the game design team? Uh, yes, for our on Tunic, um, oh, okay. I think we consider ourselves as part of the Tunic team. Okay. And yeah. Okay. Second, uh, in my game design experience, I'm work in small or medium. Team, game design team. In my experience, I usually provide a description to the musician. Then the musician provides their music to me, and the work is done. Perfect. Uh, uh, not perfect, but it's okay. Uh, uh, our, commu our communication is one direction. But However, you mentioned that game music and the game design can be explored together. Yes. I think that you mean the designer provide a description to musician and then the musician back their, uh, their music for game design. Then game designer listen the music and uh, make more detail. Then the musician get the detail, so fix your music. Music. Uh. Okay, this is my question. Uh, how do you calculate the associate cost for the music uh, revision? Uh, many, many fixed times. Uh. How do you calculate the money, salary, reward, that. In my experience, I, I, I'm fortunate in that the projects I worked on, they didn't have many, many, it wasn't a cycle of revision and um, like constant revisions. It was more of a collaborative process where they would just trust me to do something and then it would be, they'd be happy with it with some, some feedback. So I, I never considered that to be part of the cost of making it because it wasn't like a big, um, it didn't take up much of the time. But in general, I, I tried to be able to ask for um, revenue share of the game, at least for a small team. I think that makes the most sense where everyone, every key member of the game is sharing in the success of the game. And I think that means everyone's incentives are aligned. Um, but depending on the game, like you probably still want like yeah. upfront um, money if, if the, game, the success of the game is completely unknown. Um, yeah, I think it's different for everyone because I think everyone has different risk tolerances of what uh, makes sense for them. I think I think for the average case, usually it's like you pay for a certain amount of time of uh, time finished tracks, like a certain number of minutes of soundtrack. Um, but I haven't actually worked that way very much. Um, but I do think with regards to revisions, like it is very important to set like a limit of like, like we can, this, this contract includes like two or three revisions maximum. Yeah, I think it's important to set those boundaries. We, we, when possible, we prefer working with game uh, revenue share because that way the work scales with the project or the project, because when we start out with the contracts, 
it's hard to say we're going to need 10 tracks from you. Like maybe originally when Terrence started with Tunic, that was what he thought and we ended up having to do actually more than 80 tracks. And the only, the album is, we ended up releasing was 60 tracks because that's actually the limit to what you can post onto an album through digital distribution. Um, so it'd be really hard to have to redo the contract every time. But maybe if you have a system that works, like that could, I find I've done um, pay by minute before in the past. And I find that unless it's a really ridiculously high amount, it just does not reflect the amount of time that that a musician puts into it. It's really, really hard to calculate that, I think. Yeah. But there are some standards, and they'll go from $5 for one minute of music to, you know, 10,000. And it's, that means that you'd have to have a full scope of your game already decided to understand what you could afford and what would be reasonable. I don't know if that answered the question at all. OK, OK, thank you. More questions. I think uh, the, the the answer is uh, all about the contract. Yeah. E even second controls the, the third contract. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, oh, yeah, that's a good good talk. I am, uh, f I have two questions. Uh, first question is uh, why will you or your team to do um, for the music um, the music uh, after the game launch, uh, except um, launch the OST, or what will you do? Do you mean, do we launch the music with the game or after the game? After, after, after. Oh, after. What do we do with the music after the game? Yes, yeah. yes. Um, well, we set up the soundtrack, the OST, to be released alongside with the game. We try to time it so it comes out at the same time, and then afterwards, there's, it's mostly, for us it's mostly done at that point, but like there's a few things like, maybe people wanna make like vinyl records or something, or release, just like other things that like are related to it, but for us, we, after, we used up all our energy at the end, so we just stopped yeah. doing anything after that. I think if you're on the composer side, it's really important to get your music up and ready for launch. So at the time of launch, um, the publisher and the team can help share the, you know, they're just... Oh yeah, like the marketing of your soundtrack is, it's important that the game and the publisher is supporting that and they know that beforehand. Like maybe you've talked to them about it before or you have it in your contract because there's only so much you can do as the musician. They'll have a much bigger reach. So that's kind of the time for them to, for you to just keep, keep an eye, make sure that they're doing, they're, they're helping promote the music as well. Okay, thanks. And I uh, have second question is, um, and, uh, how, how will um, you or you, um, you want to listen to like um, the game designer um, will talk to you is like um, this game uh, I want uh, some emotion like it's sad or it's, um, it's angry or uh, I just give the example, example for you is uh, like this music is I want to um, uh, create in this game and, and um, my, my question is and um, how the uh, what what way can um, both game designer and uh, music creator will um, communicate clearly or effect effectively? Um, for me, it was helpful to see, I, I kind of work more visually, so if I can see concept art or just things that inspire the designer, like colors and like textures and environments, I think that's almost enough for me to go off of to, um, to do it. Because I think, at least the way I work, I, it's hard for me to stick to a very specific description. I like to start with, use the description they give me as like a seed, and then I, I see where I'm, 
I just explore that and see where it leads me. And I might end up in like a very different direction that I originally sought out to go. So I don't think it should be too specific. I think good direction from the designer would be more about the feeling rather than like, like very specific things. I think some people like, they'll maybe create mood boards. Um, with Andrew on Tunic, um, there were a couple design documents and for every area or section he wanted music, he would just um, kind of brain dump, like write whatever words came to his mind, um, inspirations, references, any information you can give your musician that's about the ambience or the mood um, or what's happening, that, that's all really helpful. Visuals that when you're designing the game, you rely on um, to help you in your inspiration. So just the more information you give, the more they have to go off of. Also, a, a good piece of information to know is the energy that they want. Ener yeah, Mood how energetic. Energy. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that can influence music the most sometimes. Mm -hmm. Textures. Oh yeah, texture. Really texture, too. energy, mood. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, so, uh, I can uh, I can say it's just um, <coughs> I tell the total story for you. It's better than uh, I say some narrative for you. Um, yeah, telling like knowing the whole story I think helps a lot, but it also isn't always necessary. I find that like having some unknowns in our minds as the composers mm -hmm. ends up being really helpful in a way because like, if we don't know the full picture, we'll kind of fill it in with our own ideas and it'll be following the same cohesion of my mind. And so I think allowing for some unknown is, can, be, can be very beneficial, but it can also, okay. it might need to be reined in sometimes. Um, but yeah, I don't think telling the whole thing is always necessary, but it can be helpful as well. So I wouldn't worry too much about like getting every single point across. Okay, thanks. Welcome, thank you. Uh, because of time, uh, we'll let the